abrazo fuerte. En 1991, bajo el liderazgo del doctor Justo González y de otros líderes hispanos, se creó la Asociación para la Educación Teológica Hispana, AEP, con el propósito de promover el desarrollo de los programas de formación ministerial del liderazgo hispano y la colaboración entre personas, iglesias y organizaciones que forman parte de la ecología de la educación teológica. En AEP, creemos que el progreso y bienestar de nuestras comunidades depende en gran medida de la calidad de la formación teológica de líderes y pastores y de su capacidad para guiar a la Iglesia en su servicio a Dios en el mundo. Por eso, en su trabajo para los próximos cinco años, a él se ha propuesto elevar el nivel de conciencia sobre la importancia de la educación teológica y el impacto social que tiene en el papel que la Iglesia debe realizar en la sociedad. Promover que más hombres y mujeres, jóvenes y adultos, se involucren en programas de formación teológica desde la iglesia local, el instituto bíblico, hasta el seminario. Contribuir al aumento de la calidad de los programas de educación teológica que se ofrecen al liderazgo hispano. No hay ningún lugar en todos los Estados Unidos porque se encuentre una variedad tan grande de gente trabajando junta como en la ciudad. Digo, dentro de la iglesia. Eh, allí hay gente de todas las organizaciones, hay gente de todas las edades, hay gente eh, en todas las agrupaciones posibles dentro de la iglesia, no hay edad, ¿verdad? Hay jóvenes que están estudiando, hay gente que está enseñando en una gran universidad, hay pastores que pueden reunir a, a los líderes de su iglesia en un salón de iglesia para enseñar lo que pueden, hay directores de instituto bíblico, hay líderes de nacionales, hay, hay de todo. Y eso de traer todo eso junto, y nadie es más importante que traer un tipo de manual. Eso me parece que es parte del genio de la asociación. Te invitamos a que visites nuestra página web www.aet.org. www.aet.org. Y nos contactes al teléfono 407-482-7598 o a nuestro correo info arroba a él, punto poder. Buenos días. Mi nombre es Stacy Guinto Salinas uh, y hoy tengo el placer y la alegría de introducir a nuestro speaker um, para esta mañana. Dr. Justo González es a Cuban American Methodist historian and theologian. I first encountered his work when I was a junior in college, and one of my professors assigned one of his books, The Story of Christianity, Part One. I enjoyed Dr. Gonzalez's writing and felt so happy and proud to be reading the work of a Latino scholar. Dr. Gonzalez is a prolific author and influential contributor to the development of Latin American theology. He is one of the few first-generation Latino theologians to come from a Protestant background. Dr. Gonzalez co-founded the first academic journal related to Latino theology, Apuntes, which was published by the Mexican American program at Perkins School of Theology. He also helped establish the Association for Hispanic Theological Education, which we just watched a video about. Dr. Gonzalez was the first director of the Hispanic Summer Program, and he helped to establish the Hispanic Theological Initiative. He joins us here today with his wonderful wife, Catherine, whom he has co-authored 
several books with. Yes. <laughs> Dr. Gonzalez has truly paved the way and opened doors for Latinas and Latinos in both academia and the church. It is a joy to have him here with us and his wife. So please join me in welcoming Dr. Justo Gonzalez. Buenos dias. Good morning. I was instructed to uh, speak in English after discussing what we were going to do. But for those of you who do not understand Spanish, excuse me for a moment where I say just two words in Spanish. Se me ha pedido que hagamos esta presentación en primer lugar en inglés. Eh, lo hacemos por cortesía porque hay algunas personas aquí presentes que las pobrecitas cuando lleguen al cielo van a necesitar traducción. I was explaining to my Spanish speaking friends that uh, we decided to speak in English because unfortunately there are some people here present who when they get to heaven they need a translation. Uh, I am pleased to be here with you today. I was uh, also at the last assembly of Marcha, where I was asked to speak, and apparently uh, they decided they better give me a second chance. <laughs> so that's why I'm here, and it's a pleasure to be here with you. I was asked to speak about the past, I don't know whether that is because I'm a historian or because I am a relic of the past. <laughs> But anyway, it's a pleasure to be here with you. It's a pleasure because I think it's important to underline the importance of history. And because history is never written from the past, I have said that repeatedly, history is never written from the past. It is written from the present in which the historian stands and also from the future for which the historian hopes or which the historian dreads. But this is particularly true of Christianity because our faith is deeply rooted in events in the past. And it is equally rooted in the promises of God in the future for which we hope and which we seek to reenact and announce. Therefore, allow me to speak of the past as I was ordered, yes, but with the privilege of the old, I will do as I please. <laughs> There is a group, uh, I was just visiting a disciples church in Puerto Rico where the older folk have a, a, a motto, hacemos lo que nos da la gana in the context of our past. I was another director besides the director about the past, and I was told in the context of our past. I was told that I was also to connect uh, what was going to be said with what we said last year about the fellowship of the development of leadership. And that's one more reason to speak about the future. Because what is leadership? Leadership is precisely, I mean, what is training leadership? Training leadership is precisely to prepare people for the future. When those of us who are training them now will no longer be here. For these reasons, I have decided, well, first of all, let me say, even before I go further, that There are two great pleasures of a meeting like this for me. One is uh, uh, frequently, 
some friends that uh, have met in other match meetings over the years and years, Elias. <laughs> but there's another, another pleasure, greater pleasure than that, seen before, to see a new generation, to see that the, the torch is being passed on. Leadership development is uh, oh, something like a race in which one generation gives a baton to the next generation, or perhaps like an Olympic torch being carried that we pass one to another, knowing that at some point later on, there will be a light that will be seen by the whole world. For these reasons, I have decided to focus on what I deem to be the crucial theological issue of our day, and one that should be at the heart of all our leadership formation, and indeed of all the decisions and planning, a theological issue that will be also the context of the debates and the issues of the upcoming extraordinary session of General Conference. For some time, many of us have been saying that the main contribution to Christian theology in the 20th century was the refocusing on the doctrine of the Holy Spirit. That had been fostered, as you know, by a return to a number of early Christian writings, but also by the tremendous experience of the work of the Spirit, of the Spirit throughout the world, rising the church up in many different ways, in many different cultures. But now, however, I feel that it is necessary to take this matter a step forward and to relate the doctrine of the Holy Spirit with the doctrine of the church. I dare say that future historians, when they write about the 21st century and about our day, they will probably say that the 20th century was the century of the spirit when it came to the development of theology. And that the 21st century was the century of the church. And that may be, must be so because there is a connection between the doctrine of the Holy Spirit and the doctrine of the church. Significantly, in all the ancient creeds of Christianity, those two were joined together. We say repeatedly, when we say the Apostles' Creed, we believe in the Holy Spirit the Holy Catholic Church. The Nicene Creed, the most universally used uh, accepted creed in all of Christianity, by the way, much more widely used than the Apostles' Creed. The Nicene Creed says, believe in the Holy, we believe in the Holy, in the one Holy Catholic and Apostolic Church. This is how it should be but there has always been that connection between the events of Pentecost and the birth and the growth of the church. Without Pentecost, there will be no church. Without the church, the work of Pentecost would have gone for naught. Hmm? Unfortunately, in much of the renewed emphasis of the Holy Spirit in the 20th century, there was also an individualistic undertone that obscured the relationship between the Holy Spirit and the church. We came to think of the Holy Spirit as something that comes to me individually. That the church is simply a place where those of us who have been so moved by the Holy Spirit in our own private lives gather in order to praise God for that gift. Furthermore, the notion soon developed that the extraordinary gifts of the Holy Spirit somehow should give people extraordinary authority in the church, somehow making those that experience those gifts more respectable, supposedly better Christians than the rest. As common as such views are, particularly among Latino and Latina believers, they are still unbiblical. In the crucial narrative in Acts 2, the Spirit comes upon the church when they are all gathered together. 
And contrary to what we often think and what we see in pictures and museums and so on, the Holy Spirit does not come only to the apostles, but to all who are gathered together. And they all heard, each in their own tongue, and sons and daughters prophesied, and the young saw visions. Listen, you young folks, and the young saw visions. And the old dreamed dreams. And people generally marginalized in society, slaves, received the power of the Spirit so that they too would prophesy. No matter what present day self name apostles say, the Spirit is never been, has never been about giving power to some so that they can lord it over others. The Holy Spirit has always been about sharing power so that all can hear and all can speak, each in their own tongue. Cada uno en su propia lengua. Mm -hmm. At any rate, if it is true that Pentecost marks the birth of the church, it is also true that the church is the main manifestation and result of the coming of the Spirit. And this is why the ancient creeds, again, immediately after affirming, believe in the Holy Spirit, affirm also as part of that third clause, believe in the church. Today, as throughout most of its history, the church is embattled. This certainly is true of the United Methodist Church. As we look to the next general conference with both expectation and dread. But it is also true of the church at large, oppressed in some parts of the world by hostile governments, and in other parts of the world, I might say in our part of the world, held hostage to supposedly friendly governments that co-opt it for their nefarious purposes. Furthermore, the church is embattled not only from outside, but even more so from the inside, by threats of schism, by obnoxious language that we seem to have learned from the political arena, and in short, by lack of charity. Given some circumstances, I suggest that we begin today, I believe, in the Holy Catholic Church. It is my hope that a clearer understanding of the nature and calling of the church will help us to find new ways to respond to the challenges before us, ways that are more congruent with the nature and the calling of the church. And it is also my hope that as we develop new leadership, we guide it into a fuller understanding of the nature and mission of the church and a way from the errors of the past. Let me begin with Catholicity. As early as the second century, even before the New Testament was completed, Christians began referring to their community as the Catholic Church. Now, what do they mean by that word? We are often told that Catholicity is the same as universality. And as a result, many of us grew up affirmation, affirming, I believe in the Holy Universal Church. That's particularly true of those of us who grew up in Latin America. The word Catholic referred to a particular denomination, a particular form of Christianity, and we were taught, therefore, to say, I believe in the universal church rather than the Catholic church. In other words, in our setting, to say I believe in the Catholic church was as if uh, in our Methodist church, we will say I believe in the Presbyterian church. Hmm? Hmm? <laughs> it was somebody else, okay? <laughs> but the truth is that Catholicity is not the same as universality. Indeed, in some ways, the two are opposed. Clearly, both Catholicity and universality refer to a church 
that knows no geographic boundaries to a church that is present or at least seeks to be present throughout the world. But there is a difference in the etymology and therefore in the actual meaning of the two words. What universality implies sameness throughout the world, Catholicity affirms the differences within the whole. The word Catholic is a result of two Greek roots. The first of those roots is the preposition kata, which means according to, and that is the, presuppos the preposition that is used in the titles of the Gospels. When you open your Bible and you say that it says uh, 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 the Gospel according to Matthew, what it says in the Greek is Evangelion kata Matthai, or then whoever the other three are. Okay? Uh, the second root of the word Catholic is the word holos, meaning the whole, the totality. It is the root that we employ, employ in words such as hologram and holocaust. Hologram meaning an image that includes a variety of perspectives and holocaust meaning an offering that is completely, totally burnt. And we put together into a single word, catholic. These two roots mean according to the whole, according to all. And in order to make my point clear from now on, during the rest of this morning, I will rather than speaking about catholic, I'll speak about catholic to emphasize the, the, the roots of that word and to make it clear that I'm not talking about a particular denomination, that the Catholic with a capital C or any of that. The church, Catholic. I believe in the holy Catholic church. When we take this into account, we realize that while there are many points of contact between the universal and the Catholic, there is also a significant difference. Universality is a uniform presence of the same thing everywhere, with little or no change. Actually, what we call universal usually is the result of the imposition of the power of the powerful that can call the shots and establish what is going to be universal. Catholicity, Catholicity requires by its very nature, a diversity of perspectives and interpretations. One of the first ancient Christians to use the word Catholic was second century Bishop Arrhenius of Lyon, one of my favorite theologians, and arguing that there should be four gospels. He says that just as there are four Catholic winds, there should be for Catholic Gospels. Now, what he meant by Catholic winds, he does not mean that they had a Pope. Okay. What he means is that if there were only the North Wind, that wind would be universal, but there would be no Catholic wind. For the wind to be Catholic, you have to have the North Wind, and the East Wind, and the South Wind, and the West Wind. Hmm? Likewise, Arrhenius argues, the Catholic witness to the gospel is the fourfold witness that we now have. If we had only the gospel of Matthew, listen to this, if we had only the gospel of Matthew, it would be perfectly orthodox. All that it says will still be true. It would be a universal gospel, but it would not be the Catholic witness to the gospel. And there was a particular witness in the church, a particular wisdom in the church when they decided to take these four gospels that are different. And sometimes that difference bothers us. I remember trying to give a witness to my classroom students and some guy coming in and say, okay, now come on, let's look here now. How many, how many fish and how many breads, uh, loaves of bread did Jesus use to feed how many people? And I couldn't answer because there are different witnesses in the gospel. So in many ways, I wish that we just had a universal gospel, but that is not the nature of the gospel that the church 
understood and the church in its wisdom put together four different gospels and put them together precisely because they're different. Because if you go to a trial and you have 10 witnesses and all say exactly the same thing about what happened, if the judge has any brains, he's going to hold them all in contempt of court because they are all fixed. If you have four witnesses that agree on the crucial issue, but they give a different perspective, a different uh, details and so on, then probably the issue is true and the four witnesses are very, very powerful. And the church did the same thing. So when we say that the church is Catholic, we are not saying simply that it exists everywhere. We are not even simply that it's the same church that has existed over the centuries. We are saying that there is a, ch it's a church in which a variety of perspectives and experiences of the saving gospel of Jesus Christ are essential. No matter how large it may be, a church that is not Catholic is a sect. Because what the word sect means is, comes from section, it's a piece. And sectarianism means taking a part and using it as a whole. So a church, again, no matter how big, if he says we are the only church, and everybody else is wrong, it's a sect. Thus, when we, United Methodists, affirm that we believe in the Catholic Church, we are declaring on the one hand that we are fully aware that United Methodism is just one part within the whole scope of the Church Catholic. But we are also declaring that we believe that this particular portion of the Church that calls itself United Methodist, in order to be truly Catholic, also needs the various perspectives of people in different walks of life with different experiences of the gospel, representing different cultures and races with different lifestyle, personal lifestyles. More concretely, this means that the function of matcha and other minorities and minority caucuses within the United Methodist Church is not just to advocate for people who would otherwise be underrepresented and underestimated in the church. And that is very important, that's crucial, we should not abandon that. And it is not just to advocate for other minorities in our society and throughout the world, and that is also very important. But part of the work of Matcha Part of the contribution of Matcha to the United Methodist Church is helping the United Methodist Church be truly Catholic. So we are certainly grateful for the United Methodist Church and what it is doing among Latinos and Latinas and other minorities, but we are also affirming and insisting that in order to be truly Catholic, United Methodism needs us just as much as we need it. And given the connection between the work of the Spirit and the life of the Church, we must also trust and affirm that the same Holy Spirit who on that Pentecost made all one Church, as they each heard in their own tongue, will today lead the Church to be truly Catholic as it embraces within itself a variety of perspectives, emphasis, and understandings of Christian life. But that is just one of the things that the creeds say about the church. To that we must add that the creeds also affirm not only that we believe in the Catholic church, but that we believe in the holy Catholic church. And here again, we need to clarify what that means, what those words mean. And to make sure that the new 
develop the new leadership that we are developing understands clearly what we mean when we speak of the holiness of the church. Unfortunately, as I visit United Methodist Hispanic churches, I found many of our members and among many of our leaders a misunderstanding of the holiness of the church that is tragic. It's a serious matter because such misunderstandings have repeatedly led to continued divisions and schisms. We all know the story. Within the denomination, with the local church, there's always a group that's holier than the rest. <laughs> and they move away and they make, uh, they create a, a holy church. And the years go by. And when the holy group another develops, that's holier than the holy. <laughs> and then you break away and you create a new church. And at the end, you're reminded, remember the old Sears catalogs that say, said good, better, and, and best? It looks like we have now churches that are good, better, and best. And because the best can always be improved, we keep them divided and dividing ad infinitum. Right? In some ways, some of the bitter, well, the bitter debates among us as General Conference approaches have to do precisely with this misconception of the holiness of the church. Some seek to make the church holier by expelling from it those whose personal lifestyles they find unacceptable. And even though I find it difficult to confess, those of us who insist on the primacy of the commandment of love also seem to think that the more loving a church is, the holier it will be. But the truth is that the holiness of the church is not based on the purity of its members. It's not even based on the love of its members. The church is holy not because its members are holy, but because its head is holy. We may find this difficult to accept and understand, but this is what the New Testament leads us to believe. Very briefly, look at Paul's first epistle to the Corinthians. Addressed to whom? To the saints in Corinth. And then what does he say? Read the fifth chapter. It is said that there is among you fornication and such fornication as not to be found even among the Gentiles. And these people, Paul calls saints. Because they are saints, not because they are so good. They are not saints because they abstain from evil. They abstain because through the power of the Holy Spirit, they have been made part of this body whose head is holy. And the same is true of the church today. Were I to believe that the holiness of the church depends on my goodness and my virtue, there is no way I could stand up with a straight face and say, I believe in the Holy Church. And I think the same thing will any of us if we actually stop to think about it. So let us not deceive ourselves. Whatever the outcome of general conference might be, it would not make the church one whit holier. One group may claim that it has taken a stand because it holds to a strict morality. Another group may claim that it holds to a wider understanding of love. And each of us will be convinced that we are holier than the other. But we are not. We are holy because the grace of God is such that it has seen fit to join us to this holy body of the Holy One. But then, there's a third emphasis in the creedal affirmations regarding the church. And because of that affirmation, we have come to, we come to realize that if there is a division, 
we must not deceive ourselves into thinking that there will be two churches. The Nicene Creed clearly affirms it. We believe in the one holy, Catholic, and apostolic church. No matter how much we dislike it, or how difficult it is to believe it, the church is one and will never be more than one. A fairly conservative Baptist pastor in Buenos Aires once told me, if the church is the bride of Christ, Christ has a bride and not a harem. See? In order to understand what is meant by the church being one, it may be good to turn to an image frequently used by Latinos and Latinas when speaking about the church. Quite often we speak of the family of God, the familia de Dios. An image taken obviously from the epistle to the Ephesians, uh, chapter 2, verse 19, uh, where the author refers to Christians as members of the family of God. Literally, it's very interesting that the Spanish translates familia. The English translates it as household. And that is because the word familia is not the same thing as the word family. If you ask me how many in your family when you were growing up, I say, well, four of us, my two parents, my brother and I. If you ask me how many were in your family when you were growing up, ooh, I would say, I don't know. <laughs> they were my cousin, and my other cousin, my second cousin, my third cousin, my umpteenth cousin, <laughs> and my aunt, and my, and my uncle, and, and, and we have words that you don't have in English, consuegros, and the compadres, and the comadres, and the, all these people are part of the familia. So that while very often in English, we do not like to speak of the church as a family because that tends, seems to make it close. You say family is people who are all in the same household. When we speak about familia, we're talking about a bond whose limits we do not know. That expands and is constantly expanding in, in many, many, many different ways. But there's one thing that is in common in both cases. And that is that both are given to us and we can neither opt out of them nor expel those whom we do not like. You remember yesterday's sermon, what Yolanda was telling us about her cousin. You might not want there, but she's there. In, we may have somebody in the family that we dislike, somebody that we reject, somebody who is against all our principles, somebody that simply seems not to fit. But they're still a relative. And we're stuck with them. By the way, the passage from Ephesians that we have been using, uh, the word vinculo, bond, is not just a a little tie that binds you. Vinculo is a chain. Bond is the same root as bondage. We are enchained to this family. We cannot opt out of it. Even if we don't like it, they touch us. Are you here? Are you here? Yeah. Yeah. Now, that, that is also true when it comes to the family of God. We may disagree violently. We may claim that the other is not a real Christian. We may feel that they are not as pure as they should be, or we may feel that they are not as loving as they should be, or as forgiving as they should be. But they are still part of our family. We are stuck with them. This is what we declare when we believe, when we declare that we affirm that we believe in the one holy church. Just as the church is not holy because it is pure, 
So is not one because it is in full agreement or because it has a single government or because it bears a single denomination name or for any other reason of its own. Mm -hmm. The church is one because by the work of the Holy Spirit, it is the one and only body of the one and only head, the one and only saint, Jesus Christ. We are one body because we are baptized into the same Christ. We may be sufficiently rigid and unforgiving to divide the United Methodist Church. But no matter what we do, we have no power to divide the one holy Catholic Church. In a word, just as we are one family, we are stuck with one another. Uh, and we might as well realize it and take that as our starting point. And no matter how much we act as if this were not the case, we are still all members of the same church. For the same spirit who brought us into the church would not let us go. The bondage, the vinculo, the chain of peace. Hmm? This is what makes divisions in the church so tragic. As tragic as divisions within the family. Hmm? When we reject one another, we also reject and deny who we are and who we are called to be. When a part of this one holy Catholic Church splits, we must look upon it, not as a matter of who won and who lost, but as one looks at a family in which siblings go to court to argue over an inheritance. Hmm? When we claim the inheritance of faith, when, when children claim the inheritance of their parents against the other children, they are disgracing not only themselves, but also their parents. When Christians, Christians of any kind, claim the inheritance only for themselves, the inheritance of faith only for themselves, but at the same time, we, we do not realize that we are also disgracing not only ourselves, but blaspheming against the one whose inheritance we claim. Mm -hmm. To bring that to our own experience, we cannot break the church, we cannot break the family, but we can disgrace it. It is as if two, an aunt and an uncle in one of our families have an argument. And then they start having, and to see who can have more people come to my party. That turns into an Ochemala, right? <laughs> Now, all of this sounds so easy. We must accept one another. We can accept one another's contribution in order to be truly Catholic. Holiness does not depend on us. It is a gift of the Holy Spirit. Unity is a gift of God that we cannot destroy no matter how hard we try. So apparently, being part of this one holy Catholic church it's not all that difficult. All we have to do is be nice to one another and live happily ever after. But then, then comes in the Nicene Creed again. We believe in the one holy Catholic and apostolic church. Apostolic. The word needs to be redefined because in most discussions uh, about whether the church is apostolic or how it's apostolic, the emphasis falls in holding to apostolic doctrine. As a historian, I'll tell you that no church can really claim that. Sometimes uh, being apostolic is a matter of uh, claiming that we have a direct succession from the apostles. 
as a historian, I can tell you that most of those claims are rather shaky. <laughs> More recently, some people claim that the church is apostolic because they're led by somebody who's part of a network of people who have decided to call themselves apostles. <laughs> and as a Christian, I can tell you that this is thoroughly unbiblical. All those various interpretations leave aside the true meaning of apostolic calling. You know, if we look back at the meaning, the original meaning of the word apostle, apostolos, it was originally used most often of ships getting ready to sail. A whole fleet was going. And it included, obviously, the, the, the word, that, the verb that it comes from, which, which is sending, but it also included this notion that they are going out there someplace that is different, that is unknown, it's, it's, not, it's not home, it's, it's, it's the ocean, it's the waves, it's the storms, who knows what's coming, but that is what they are for, they are being sent. And it is because it is apostolic that the church finds it so difficult to express its true nature as one, holy, and Catholic. It is in being apostolic that the church meets the world with all its tragedies, its injustices, its oppressions, its ambiguities. Or as we will say today, that's where the rubber meets the road. What makes, difficult, what makes it difficult for the church to live out the fact that it is one, holy and Catholic is that it exists and must exist in and for this very messy world into which it is sent. Precisely because the church is apostolic, its members have to make decisions in the context of the complex, ambiguous, disorderly, perplexing world in which the church lives and to which the church is sent. It will be quite easy and simple for United Methodists to withdraw into our own shells, to ignore all the struggles of the world around us and thereby to avoid controversies and preserve some semblance of unity. It will be easy, but it will not be true to our apostolic calling. We are called into the world. We are called to be with the world. We are called to rejoice in the joys of the world and the society and to mourn the tragedies of the world and to rebel against the injustices of the world. And since people do not always see those joys and those tragedies and those injustices in the same way, we are called to struggle within ourselves and among ourselves with the ambiguities of the world and to seek to practice love and to do justice in the, me in the midst of those perplexing circumstances. They just stuck together. <laughs> now that's not a new problem for the church. Already in the New Testament uh, times, Christians clashed among themselves regarding the matter in which Gentiles were to be added to the church. During times of persecution, Christians disagreed as to what should be their attitude vis-a-vis -vis the state and about how and under what circumstances those who had denied the faith when threatened by torture and persecution could be now readmitted into the church. In the fourth century, many of the greatest leaders of the church clashed with society and with the authorities because they perceived the order of society and injustice within it to be irreconcilable with the demands of the gospel. Since I'm a historian, let me go a little bit more into that because that's part of what I like. So you have to hear it. The fourth century uh, 
was uh, characterized by a number of leaders who sought ways to promote justice in every sphere of society. And while they certainly dealt with matters of sexuality, they were, not more they were much more concerned with issues of exploitation and the plight of the poor. On which point, by the way, they simply followed the example of the Bible for, for any one verse that you can quote me dealing with issues of sexuality, I can quote you 10,000 that deal with economic justice. Just to clarify what I mean, let me just give you a few quotations that may be a sample for some of us who preach. Basil of Caesarea, Basil the Great. When the time comes, seeds germinate and animals grow, but capital begins to reproduce from the moment it is begotten. The beasts become fertile soon and cease reproducing equally soon. Capital, on the other hand, immediately produces interests and these continue multiplying into infinity. Everything that stops, that grows, stops growing when it reaches its normal size. But the money of the greedy never stops growing. Preach that. Ambrose of Milan, preaching to a wealthy congregation, says, uh, you strip people naked and dress up your walls. The naked poor cries at your door and you do not even look at him. It is a naked human being that begs you when you are considering what marbles to use for paving. The poor begs you for money and gets none. There's a human being asking for bread and your horses chew gold in their bits. You rejoice in your precise adornments while others have nothing to wear. The people are hungry and you close your granaries. The people cry out and you show your jewels. Woe to the one who can save so many lives and does not. And finally, the greatest preacher of all time, John Chrysostom. Preaching before the richest and the most powerful in the empire, including the emperor and the empress. The gold bit in your horse's mouth, the gold bracelet on the wrist of your slave, the gilding on your shoes, mean that you are robbing the orphan and starving the widow. When you have passed away, each passerby who looks upon your great mansion will say, how many tears did it take to build that mansion? How many orphans were stripped? How many widows wronged? How many laborers deprived of their honest wages? And so, even after death, you will not be delivered from your accusers. Now, preaching in such terms is not an easy thing then, it's not an easy thing now. Chrysostom paid with exile and death as a result of that sermon. Such preaching is always costly. It was, so, it was so costly that by the next century, the church had become accommodated to the existing order of society. Such prophetic preaching seldom was heard and when it was heard, was very rapidly quashed. Either wittingly or unwittingly, Christians began avoiding conflict with the state and with society by concentrated on the more private aspects of sin and not saying much about its social manifestations. In a word, sin was individualized and sexualized. Sin now had to do mostly with an individual's action rather than with that individual's actions vis-a-vis -vis other people. While violence was still the cry that the church spoke against violence, this usually referred to the violence of one person against another and not to the violence done to, by society 
at large to the poor, the powerless, and the marginalized. What came to be known as the seven deadly sins all had to do with individual behavior. Think about them. Pride, greed, lust, envy, gluttony, wrath, and sloth. Where is exploitation? Where is abuse? Where is injustice? And at the same time, sin became increasingly sexualized. The church became the guardian of morality. That is, of morality, mostly understood as sexual behavior. And let it be said in passing, since women were often seen as mere sexual objects, they too were considered particularly sinful. Thus, for instance, Mary Magdalene, who had seven demons. The Bible doesn't say what kind of demons they were, but we have decided they were sex demons. In a way, that is inheritance that we have to this day. If somebody talks about somebody being a sinful woman, you don't say that she's exploiting the poor. It's some other kind of sin. Now, this has led to a tragic situation in which debates about sexuality obscure important issues in Christian obedience. A Jesuit priest once told me about his waking up moment when in a church in Tijuana, an elderly lady said, if we were fetuses, the whole church would be defending us. But since we were born and we are poor, nobody cares. We were born and we were poor, nobody cares. Hmm? Clearly, one reads between the lines, one realizes that in that context, the defense of the unborn often takes overtones of punishing women for their sexual behavior. But once the child is born, it has nothing to do with not having enough to eat, with not having clothing, with not having care, with not having education. And yet to this day, many people, many in our congregations, perhaps many of us think that defending the unborn is enough for getting the born. For similar reasons, many churches today are suffering systems over issues of sexual morality. Now, those issues are important, and the church certainly must debate them. But if the church is to be truly apostolic, truly bringing the message of God's grace and God's justice and God's salvation to the world, we cannot allow such debates to obscure the other burning issues of our time. It is often said that when the Turks were besieging Constantinople in the, in the 15th century, theologians were debating the nature of angels. That may or may not be true. But I fear that some decades from now, the time may come when people will say that when children were being wrenched away from their parents, as a means of torture. At a time when tyrants were poisoning their enemies, even beyond their own national borders. At a time when the supposed political leader, the leaders of, of freedom and democracy were making those tyrants their friends. At a time when the whole ecosystem was being threatened and the entire planet was threatened with destruction. Churches were debating the nature and place of homosexuality. And I wonder whether people will say, and those Christians in the early 21st century understood homosexuality just as most of those theologians in the 15th understood the angels. 
as we look at our present responsibility in the light of the past, we remember, uh, the past will remember and of the future for which we hope. As we pass to a new generation, the torch that our ancestors bequeathed to us, we need to develop a leadership that is fully aware that it is not enough for the church to be one, holy, and Catholic. The Holy Spirit who created the church also requires it to be apostolic. As an apostolic church, we must reject all forms of injustice and idolatry, including the idolatry of nature, of nation, and of citizenship. Remember that Paul had the most coveted citizenship of his time. And then he said, our citizenship is in heaven. And Peter declares that Christians are a holy nation, God's own people. The full proclamation of the gospel of Jesus Christ requires that the church engage society at large, point out its inequities and its iniquities, and continue proclaiming its hope for a new reign of love, peace, and justice, when the glory of the Lord will cover the earth and no one will have to leave the land of their birth, fleeing death or famine, a new reign of peace in which nations will turn the swords into plowshares and their budgets will include more resources for education than for weapons of mass destruction, a new reign of justice when they will sit each under their own fig tree and no one shall make them afraid, not any demagogue, not any tyrant, not any border patrol. Until that time, until that time, even in the midst of pain and even in the midst of bitter disagreements, thanks to the presence of the Holy Spirit, we live by faith, we live by hope, and we live by love. But the greatest of this is love. May God bless you. Muchas gracias. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Justo Gonzalez, for that powerful um, and thought-provoking message. We're now going to have a time uh, for two.